Good morning, everyone. I am Elaine O'Neill, the Director of Science and Sustainability at Quorum and an affiliate faculty at the University of Washington in Seattle. Quorum is the Consortium for Research on Renewable Industrial Materials. It's a 20 university consortium that has been doing life cycle research on wood products since 1996. Today, I'm gonna to present a synthesis of our work that makes the case for wood as being a readily implemented carbon negative technology that can be used to make a substantial impact on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we generate from our modern society. When we think about reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere using carbon capture and storage systems, one of the more obvious approaches is to grow more trees. And indeed that it does make sense as trees are very efficient at absorbing tremendous amounts of carbon using very little nitrogen or other minerals, albeit they need a lot of water. By dry weight, trees are about 50% carbon. So on the surface, efforts like carbon credits for growing forests, mechanisms to protect forests from harvest, keeping forests as forests, and most recently the Trillion Tree Initiative make a lot of sense. However, the premise of this talk is that establishing and keeping forests is but the first step in a readily implemented carbon negative technology that could have significant climate benefits. The other step involves examining how that forest is managed, what products it produces, and how long the products last in use before being reused, burned for energy, or discarded in what is the full life cycle. So this quilt is what it looks like to place that science in art. Here, obviously on the left, you have the growth of the uh, stylized tree, but all the steps to get to that tree, the planting and the management and the, the treatments, and then ultimately using that tree to uh, harvesting it and using it in to create manufactured wood products that go into buildings, either houses or cross laminated timber, uh, showing the full life cycle is the, is the full extent of the, the quilt. Having science placed in such an artful context was the idea of Bruce Lipke, professor emeritus at the University of Washington and longtime quorum president, and his wife Barbara, a quilter par excellence. Bruce is one of my collaborators on this synthesis, along with Chad Oliver, Pinchot Professor and now Professor Emeritus at Yale School of Environment, and Maureen Putman, who's my colleague at Quorum, President of Woodlife Consulting, past FPS President, and the 2020 recipient of the Fred Gottschalk Award. Congratulations, Maureen. Together, we have taken more than 20 years worth of data intensive inquiry and stepped back to place it into a framework that helps articulate how wood can best be used in the circular economy to maximize climate benefits and, and services to society. So you'll find all that data on our wood products library um, with the link there on the, on the screen and it covers four US regions, virtually all the durable wood products, biofuels, some comparative analysis, and really represents the efforts of over 100 authors from 17 institutions. The underpinnings of the framework rely on life cycle analysis, or LCA, to characterize the inputs and outputs to the forest, wood product, wood in use, and disposal system. Well, we have characterized many more environmental impacts and benefits than those affecting the carbon cycle. This talk is specifically focused on the carbon consequences of growing forests and using wood products. We're gonna start with forest management. Our earliest work started with a single acre or a single hectare examples. We started with bare ground, so that was post-harvest. So that's you know, down here at zero, if you'll look on the chart, zero metric tons of carbon per hectare. And then we grow that forest through time based on some average inputs in management activities that occur to grow that forest. At year, in this case, at year 45 for the Pacific Northwest, we harvest that forest. And then once we harvest it, we allocate the volume, the carbon accumulated, 
to various pools. So for example, the residues that are left in the woods are dead, the, the dead pool, and it decays over time. And then you have your long life products in blue and your short life products in this sort of orangey color. The short life products are also gonna decay over time. So your paper, for example, your long life product is gonna go into a building which will eventually be decayed. What we what we did is said it lasted 80 years and then we would dispose it without energy recovery. And so that's this particular simulation. Now, this biofuel line is a credit or, or a carbon credit we're taking for displacing fossil fuels by uh, burning wood waste instead of fossil fuels, usually in the drying process. But that energy is also accounted for below the line. So we're counting it as an emission, but we're also taking credit for the carbon stored in the wood that we burned. And so you'll have that for rotation over rotation. You, you repeat it again and again. So what you have here is basically three and a half rotations of a single acre or a six, a single hectare of the carbon consequences and the carbon stock of that hectare. Then we use an average value for the benefit of building with wood instead of fossil fuel intensive alternative building materials like steel and concrete to generate a per acre impact of the what we call substitution. Based on a meta-analysis by Sadri and Connor, that value was set at 2.1 for this example. So that means in addition to every ton of carbon stored in the wood product itself, another 2.1 tons of carbon was not emitted from the fossil fuel derived products. So you're substituting wood for these fossil fuel derived products. And this is what we call the substitution benefit. Now you'll see in this example, a little bit of jaggedness here where we add another rotations worth of wood and then here at about 2125, where that first house, that first building is demolished, and we say all of that wood is then, all of the carbon in that wood is then emitted at that point in time. So this, here's your, your stock trend. Now, there have been three major challenges to this simple model. The first is, the, the whole conversation about talking about what others are calling forced carbon debt. It doesn't talk about the alternatives to harvest like leaving horse forests unharvested and it doesn't help the architecture, engineering and construction community, so that AEC community, figure out which alternative wood choices might be better than others. So number one, the, the confusion about carbon debt can be, has to be addressed at the landscape level. Looking at a single acre provides no context for determining if the forest which is harvested to produce wood products is managed sustainably or not. So when you look at this chart, you see this variation, uh, and that's the per acre uh, ebb and flow of carbon. But over the landscape, you know, a small landscape, you'll see a little less variation. And over a large landscape sufficient to supply a milling infrastructure that needs a stable supply, it should be essentially flat. And so in the real world context, there isn't carbon debt as long as you're managing uh, your force sustainably. Now, that's why the current Life cycle assessment LCA products are generated consistent with an international standard, ISO 21930, um, that re uh, requires that you identify whether the carbon mitigation, expected carbon mitigation benefits uh, can occur because carbon stocks are stable or increasing. Now, the question of whether or not they're stable or increasing turns out to be true for the US writ large. Uh, here is data from the U.S. Forest Service Forest Inventory Analysis nation, Nationwide Assessment from the 50s into 2017 that with their latest reporting period. And in fact, our acreage has been essentially uh, stable in almost all regions or slightly increasing and our volume has been increasing over that same period. However, there's going to be challenges ahead in the Rocky Mountains where they're experiencing extraordinary losses due to insects, disease, and fire. 
and on the Pacific coast where, where insects and disease and forest land conversion is increasing. When looking regionally at the subset of private timber lands that are producing wood products, areas with strong markets and plenty of wood production tend to maintain relatively stable carbon stocks because it is an, an incentive to maintain and manage private forests for income. Now, leaving forests unmanaged and unharvested may result in more carbon per acre, which you see here, um, as we see in some Western public forests that are not harvested relative to the intensively managed private lands. But the interesting thing is those um, volume per acre really hasn't changed much in more than a rotation. So it is a pretty stable carbon stock. But sometimes leaving those forests unmanaged is, is as likely to result in poorly regenerated forests with low stocking and consequently low carbon per acre accumulations or potential. So the difference between managing a forest in the Pacific Northwest and cutting it and letting it come back naturally tends to give you a wide range of outcomes. Leaving forests unharvested and unmanaged also does not last forever. That carbon accumulation does not last forever. As we see again from the forest inventory data showing mortality trends on public lands over the past two decades due to fires, insects, disease, and other mortality affecting mature conifer forests. Well, these forests are still growing more than they are losing to disturbance. It's just a matter of time before they become net sources of carbon instead of net sinks. These trends are most apparent in the Rocky Mountain region and to a lesser extent on the Pacific coast, which includes the drier parts of Washington, Oregon, and California. If we just leave forest to grow, the average storage for unmanaged forests in the Pacific Northwest Douglas fir region is around 175, 180 tons per hectare for the trees only. Here we're showing that using Forest Service forest inventory data for national forests in Western Washington with inventory in each age class used to represent the average carbon carry capacity across the landscape. There is no sustained rate of capture once you hit that carrying capacity, which tends to happen anywhere between 60 and 90 years in, in the Douglas fir region. Now, there are some other uh, estimates of upwards of 230, 250 tons per hectare for fully stocked stands. If they're fully stocked and been managed and left to grow, you might get up to 250 tons per hectare. And there are a few extraordinary sites that can be nearly double that amount, which have been reported in the literature here. These one-time accumulations of forest carbon reach a carrying capacity in unmanaged forests, with the maximum being easily outstripped by the cumulative impacts of storing carbon in the forest, in products, and accounting for the fossil carbon displaced when wood is used in place of alternative products. We show that average for the Douglas fir region here in combination with the PN, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest Doug fir managed forest and its average al allocation to products and substitution benefits. In the case where we're dealing with sustainably managed forests, we can use that single acre example and begin a new, more nuanced examination of the best uses of the wood coming from such forests. And this is to try to help that uh, architecture, engineering, and construction community. Now, you, when you think about those prior charts, as there's a flow of growth and decay in the forest that's balanced out from rotation to rotation, and most of your change happens there at the end of the rotation, it's actually useful to truncate the graph and look at what happens to the harvested wood and what the benefits are, depending on how it's used all while accounting for the emissions associated with all production stages. Here we show that same Douglas fir growth chart over five rotations with the forest yield at a stable value, so that's the, the stuff in green, the allocation to products based on our latest LCA data, so short life products and long life products, the emissions based on the latest LCA data, and some assumptions about how the wood is used. Now, what I've done here is overlaying on this particular chart 
the expected range of carbon benefit from leaving that forest unharvested and unmanaged. In this case, the long life products are allocated to wood studs in walls and compared to an alternative steel stud substitution in a building that lasts 90 years and then is removed from use. So at that point of uh, removing it, you assume all carbon stored in wood is emitted at the end of the life. So rather than that truncated carbon absorption period that every acre will experience when it reaches its carrying capacity, within the whole system, we estimate a sustained trend of absorbing 2.3 tons of carbon per hectare per year indefinitely, which is about 1.9 times the no harvest maximum by year 135. So by three rotations. Using the same underlying data, but substituting the wood for a concrete block and gypsum wall in the Pacific Northwest, we end up with a large bump up in carbon benefit with a sustained trend of 5.9 tons of carbon per hectare per year, which exceeds the no harvest maximum within the first rotation. The range of carbon stored in the unmanaged forest is again scaled for perspective. Now, some important caveats in both these cases. The building code has a significant impact on the outcome. For example, this substitution in the Pacific Northwest is nearly twice as high as it is for the same substitution in the Southeast region because the seismic codes in the Pacific Northwest to account for our earthquake risk uh, make concrete, you know, there's so much more energy that has to go into making the concrete and the rebar in the in the Pacific Northwest than in the Southeast. So it makes concrete look much worse than wood for this standard construction method. Now, on the other hand, and this isn't shown on this chart, but they want to talk about the uh, cases where the opposite is true. The newness of using cross-laminated timber in taller buildings has resulted in some significant additional code requirements for fire safety. Uh, for example, like triple gypsum on the walls for anything over eight stories. Now, that substantially impacts the footprint of these wood-based buildings relative to their concrete framed alternatives. So the code is really driving, the building code is really driving this story. Leaving the code differences aside, the most significant driver of these potential impacts and benefits is the large difference in the global warming potential, which is basically measuring carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, that arise from the production of the different kinds of materials and components that go into buildings. Producing concrete block generates nearly five times as many emissions as a wood stud, and all of those emissions come from fossil fuel sources. Now, wood obviously also takes energy to produce, but in many cases, the ener energy sources are from biomaterials, usually coal products and wood waste, from the manufacturing process. And those are shown here in green for these three examples. Now, for certain, the green bar is counted as an emission, but it's not an emission from burning fossil fuel. It is a renewable fuel that was part of the carbon uptake of the forest, along with the wood that ends up in the final product. Now, these kinds of charts are useful from a systems perspective to assess trade-offs and look at opportunities, but they don't really tell that AEC community much. For that, it's useful to compare the LCA data on a functional unit basis. In these examples, a square meter of wall, floor, or assembly. The data measure both, both the carbon stored, which is on the, the right-hand side of the graph, and the fossil carbon emissions displaced in kilograms of carbon dioxide per square meter of wall, floor, or assembly. If, for example, the, that wood is used for studs that replace steel studs in a, in a wall, the LCA data indicate the actual stored plus displaced carbon per square meter of wall is 34.7 kilograms. If that wood stud replaces concrete block, it's a little over 44 kilograms. If we use that same wood and instead create a square meter of floor, the stored plus car displaced carbon is a little over 72 kilograms. If you're using dimension lumber, but only 50, well, nearly 57 kilograms for wood eye joists. The difference arises because dimension lumber joists store more carbon than the equivalent strength wood eye joist, because they're thicker. 
When you combine the values to create a wall or floor ex example, so for uh, assembly, so for example, the combination of wood studs plus plywood uh, as compared to a steel stud wall plus plywood, the net benefit of using the wood studs is a, a little over 34 kilograms of CO2 per square meter of wall. Now, the biggest gains are found when substituting wood studs and plywood for concrete block with gypsum added nearly 106 kilograms of CO2 per square meter benefit from choosing wood. Using these comparisons is one way to assess the efficiency of a given building system, but when thinking about the forest product use continuum, it's sometimes helpful to think about how to maximize the efficiency of using the available wood fiber because it is a, a commodity product, but it's also not infinite, an infinite supply. So <clears throat> we've also done a lot of work looking at biofuels and bioenergy uses of wood fiber, which are included in these comparisons to gain perspectives on where best to allocate materials. We ge generated a dimensionless metric that measures carbon emissions displaced relative to the carbon stored in the product. In this case, the most efficient use of wood fiber relative to an alternative is substituting MDF, which is medium density fiberboard, for steel in applications such as furniture. While this may not be intuitively obvious, the relative difference in carbon footprint is nearly double the next closest alternative, which is using residues for particle board instead of for bioethanol. Our wood wall versus concrete and gypsum wall built to Pacific Northwest seismic standards comes in a distant third. And there are some surprising outcomes when comparing fuel use for wood residues relative to fossil fuel alternatives. A couple of takeaways. Using wood for building products over fuels provides higher leverage per unit of fiber used. But it certainly doesn't mean that everything should be turned into MTF or fiberboard. Turns out that longevity in use matters, and it matters a lot. Using another system-wide comparison for wood in service, we assessed what the potential benefit per hectare was if we recycled and reprocessed 40% of the wood at the end of its 90-year life. So 40% of that wood that went into that housing, we are going to be able to reuse it in this simulation. There was a gain of nearly 25% on a per hectare basis on the year-over-year -year impact per hectare of forest land under management. So you went from 3.1 tons of carbon per hectare per year for the trend to 4.1 just by extending the life of 40% of that material. Putting it all together, these alternatives and the variations in carbon consequences that arise due to the difference in the, in the use of the material, its lifespan well in use and what it offsets are all needed to arrive at estimates of the overall impact of using wood as a carbon negative technology. The work we have done in Quorum for the past 24 years has ge generated a tremendous amount of data and a broad understanding of the carbon footprint of the force management to product to use continuum. The evolution of our thinking as a consortium of 20 research institutions is moving us towards research on integrating wood products into the circular economy. I've dedicated a whole presentation to that topic so won't address it here except to say that there are a tremendous amount of research opportunities within that realm. Coming full circle, say we know a few things about this system. The world is obviously a finite place and the forests and their capacity to sequester carbon are also finite. About one-third of the U.S. land is forest land and of that about two-thirds is considered timberland but only a fraction of that timberland is harvested and used to build the kind of products discussed to today. Yes, we can and we should plant more trees, as forest management matters tremendously. But we, unless we look at the entire system with its tremendous diversity of impacts, and also at the nuances of material choice, building design, and longevity, we will fail to take full advantage of the most readily available carbon negative technology we have on the planet today. Thank you. For more information, 
My contact information is on the screen.